Virginia Silver. And uh, to uh, discuss the first black hole vote for both mass extra time. And just for a year away from sea to back. Um, so this this work was done with in cooperation mm -hmm. with a few other people, some of them your face, some of them another girl, colleges and universities, and also with my master's student, Terry Woods, who is actually looking for a good place to do his PhD. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, just to remind you what a low mass is surviving from what you maybe most of you remember. So the main point is that it's a rush hole over for binary, but there's a donor, is a low mass container, right? The periods for those binaries ranges from 10 minutes to 100 days, the ages through which the mass transfer can go on also varies very significantly, the ages of donors can vary. Um, the, but as I say, the donor has to be low mass and the compact computer is a neutron star black hole. So what you may know from some observation books is that the, uh, more than 100 low mass extra binaries are known, identified as a personal social scenario galaxy, many more hundreds in other galaxies. Few dozens in our galaxy are neutron star white dwarf low mass extra binaries. There are 17 identified personal uh, <coughs> low mass extra binaries with a black hole um, uh, non degenerate donor. And theory is that it predicts that it's much easier to make a black hole binary um, with a white dwarf companion rather than a non degenerate. And the ratio, expected ratio, is actually 1,000 to 1. Um, however, what probably you haven't heard is that pre-2008, there was no single black hole white one or white one binary was observed. And theorists have been struggling about that, even though observers didn't actually realize that there is a problem. Uh, so, uh, in 2008, in the global cluster, actually not in the field and not in our galaxy, it was absurd an object which most like to look as a black hole white dwarf container. There are several features about this. So it has a, a extremely luminosity which is characteristic of a black hole companion. Uh, uh, it has strong variability, so it is a point source. It has strong broad oxygen emission lines. It has an extremely low hydrogen to oxygen ratio. And it was identified that could be possibly a black hole of from 5 to 20 solar masses, most likely about 15 solar masses. So once the first object was detected, and it was another one in 2009, with similar properties, although the observers who observed this particular object, they said that most likely they think it's a tidal disruption of the white by intermediate mass black hole. So the reason is that that is actually worse towards finding an intermediate mass black hole. So whatever they find, they actually really believe it's an intermediate mass black hole. Well, anyway. So when people started to look at big samples of observations, trying to find whether they see a similar objects, and for similar objects, they also call them sometimes ultra luminous six resources, meaning that they most likely are not neutron stars, that we just black hole that we just, um, they uh, started to find many of them. So it was eight, uh, it wasn't in the uh, paper itself, just when you look back on the observed state and trying to identify them, you see that there's eight, in there, um, in our uh, two you know, 3,000 global clusters, and Greg Sinokov looked up in his call uh, uh, of 6,000 global cluster sample, which he observed in 2007. Uh, in 2010, he finds seven. Okay, so, but the issue is that for global clusters, it was shown and proved that it's almost impossible to create a black hole that's combined with a non degenerate companion. So, most likely, all of them actually have a white of companion. So, uh, how do you do, how do you make a black hole white dwarf binary and what you can expect? So the first issue is that how many black holes you can have in a, a global cluster. So first of all, it's as many as you can create from initial uh, mass function, right? But then what's happening, once they create it, they have a native Higgs, so they get kicked out from global clusters, so fractional and discrete. Um, so rotation traction for uh, relatively massive global clusters so that you have only 30-40% of uh, black holes shifting. Then what's happening is that your more massive stars basically uh, start to uh, have energy interaction with other stars and as a result of this energy interaction they start to go to the energy equipartition and as a result of energy equipartition what's, what's going on, they have a smaller velocity, they sit down in the core and this normally causes a spin instability. 
Um, it was believed that the black holes so effective in this fit of stability that they create a separate black hole subcluster inside the cluster, where they start to interact between each other, kick each other away, and at the current moment is only one black hole left. Um, however, some detailed numerical simulations of black hole subcluster itself show that it's actually really hard to kick out all the black holes. So you actually retain quite a significant fraction. In the other Monte Carlo simulation, more recent, where they try to simulate a whole global cluster, not only black hole subcluster, it was also found that a significant fraction of initially formed and retained after the native peaks black holes actually stay. So there is a some fraction of black holes which might stay in this subcluster and also interact uh, with the stellar population. So we, try, we can try to figure out how frequently you can form a binary with that retained black hole and uh, uh, how uh, the possibility to see a specific number of black hole white binary, or white hole binaries, what can it tell us about how many white black holes is actually left in the global cluster? So this is what we try to figure out. Uh, to, to make the connection, first thing is what you do is you try to figure out how long your black hole white hole binary can leave, right? So you form the binary, uh, it starts to master at some point, and how long you can observe. So there's a uh, lifetime for black hole white hole binaries, and you can uh, translate this lifetime for black hole white binaries back to the uh, observed uh, of, uh, <coughs> uh, global cluster sample in order to find what's your formation rate. And scale it to, uh, let's say, to the uh, you know, 10 percent of black hole binaries being retained from initial form. So our scaling factor is uh, to 10 percent of all error uh, created, and um, all the rates we try to calculate towards this uh, retention fraction. So to analyze uh, how you can create a black hole white hole binary along a sister binary. Um, there are two things. One of them is to create a, a black hole white hole binary cell, and second, you have to make this binary to start the mass transfer. So, in the bit reverse situation, I will show you first of all which binary can start the mass transfer, and already second, then, uh, at which rate we can form those binaries. Okay? <coughs> so, to understand which binary can start the mass transfer, you need to understand that there are two main processes uh, in the global cluster. Uh, one is interaction, so your black hole by binary can interact with any other object in the field, which can uh, change it. And another one is gravitation radiation that brings to the masters. So the black line here is the line that separates binaries uh, from those which will start the masters to those which, which will start first interactions with some other stars. So those which are above the black line well, have encountered first. The red line here are those which could have started mass transfer within 10 giga years. So it's sort of like a, they still uh, may start the mass transfer, but uh, um, they probably will experience the encounter first. Um, those will never start the mass transfer yet about the red line. Uh, they always will experience an encounter. Um, <coughs> And those are below the black line, they will always have a direct formation of black hole with white hole uh, LMSB. So whenever you create a binary below the black line, it will be direct formation of LMSB. Okay, so anyway, what happens to your binaries, assume that we're okay about the, those which have direct formation. So what happens to the binaries which are above the black line, right? So uh, let's say it has an encounter with a single star. The single star can be, for example, an antigenic. If it has an encounter of a single star and it can start the mass transfer during the 10 years, what will happen is that almost in all the cases, 99.9%, it will have experienced emergence. Okay, so the binary is dead. Uh, assume you can have an encounter with a single white dwarf. Uh, with a single white dwarf, the binary separation in the star which will experience uh, a white uh, uh, encounter with a single white dwarf and can start the mass transfer within 10 years. It's such that it not necessarily will experience merger, but it will experience exchange if it will have if anything will happen to the star and it will experience exchange. What happens? It's a uh, exchange occurs only if the mass of an intruder is higher than the mass of a previous companion. In this case, your binary separation with the binary is increasing, and your binary will never able to start the masters. 
So the result is that the strong encounters with single stars will never create a black hole white of binaries, um, which will lead to a direct formation of a black hole white of binary into binary. Um, Happy encounters with single stars are not the only encounters that can happen. You can have encounters with binaries. An interesting situation is that for this big mass of a black hole, and big mass ratio to the other stars in the field, the most of the encounters with binaries will result in a triple formation. In fact, the triple formation is so efficient that um, the triple formation is actually exceeds the interaction rate of single stars. Uh, if you have some reasonable binary fraction like 5%. What happens, why triples are important? The triples are important <coughs> because in some cases when the inclination of the third star is high enough, you could have a Kazan mechanism kick in. And what Kazan mechanism does, it um, in <coughs> increases the inner binary eccentricity. When it increases the inner binary eccentricity, it means that it can be pushed towards the mass transfer. So, when you create the triple star, you can bring this, your initial black hole white binary towards the mass transfer. The important thing to realize here is that it will work out only in the case if the time scale for the Kazai mechanism to kick in is shorter than the interaction time between the uh, another encounter. And apparently it is correct. So for this particular black hole white binaries, where the separation less, um, uh, let's say, radius of radii, Always, the effective time scale for the Kazan mechanism to work out is much smaller than the interaction time. So, we have a mechanism to bring the binaries towards the mass transfer if we're being, let's say, initially 80 solar radii, as many as 80 solar radii stars, through the triple induced mass transfer. <coughs> so, once the potential triple induced mass transfer is formed, it will succeed in bringing in the black or white bonus to the mass transfer. So, uh, just a few words. Another thing is the hardening. The hardening has mechanism when from multiple encounters, your binary is getting harder and harder and harder. The only issue about the hardening is that not all encounters obviously will uh, make the binary hard. Some of them will kill the binary. And so when you consider the hardening, you need to take into account. And what we found that is indeed the fraction of the binary search, for example, starting with initial biocombi solar radii, is Relatively small, it's 0.8% of those who can make it towards the time when the triple induced mass transfer can work out. But nonetheless, as overall, it's much more, much more of those binaries in general. So you bring the bigger population towards the mass transfer. So what we are actually doing now to show you that you can consider the range of your initial black hole white hole binaries bigger and bigger and bigger, swap them out and bring them to the mass transfer. So now, when we know what it's doing, uh, we can tell a little bit about how we form. The formation mechanism is not that exciting, it's as usual as exchanges. And so this directly coupled to the number of binaries that you have in the global cluster. And it became apparent for us that, that <coughs> none of the exchanges can form a, a low mass exchange binary from direct formation. It's always when we have to invoke a triple induced mass transfer. And always we have to, and in many uh, cases we have to use the hardening in order to bring the binary towards mass transfer. Another mechanism which was very useful in order to form ultra complex binaries is a uh, collision with the ray giant. Apparently for black holes it doesn't work that well. Uh, it's very small fraction of those collisions that can lead to a direct formation. And again, um, we know what fraction of uh, those collisions can form a bound binary, but most of those binary can be brought to the mass transfer only through the triple induced mass transfer. So, just to say some numbers, so um, this is physical collision. It's the only uh, those which don't require triple induced mass transfer. The, re the formation rate is extremely small. It's about 100 times more than it's needed in order to explain the observations even if you retain many, many stars. And in many cases, well, let's say in most cases, we need to invoke a triple induced mass transfer. And uh, <coughs> just to say, the conservative and optimistic scenario are different in the way that the conservative uh, make all the binaries, um, extra binaries within one degree year, and optimistic is in several degrees. But nonetheless, what we found is that we can't explain the formation rate of observations with conservative estimate, 
which we believe like 100%, uh, only if uh, all 10% of binaries is, or uh, 10% of black holes is retained. So basically, 10% of all our form black holes have to stay be there in the global cluster and be uh, available for interactions with black holes. In the optimistic case, we can decrease it by 1%, uh, by 10 times to 1% of uh, all initially formed black holes. But, the, uh, let's, uh, but the, the, <coughs> the point to be taken away is that at least 1% of all ever formed black holes they stay in the cluster, they are available for interactions, and most likely they will also form a black hole, black hole binary, because it's not necessarily going to form only binaries with uh, normal stars. And so maybe the leading detection from global cluster can show us on. Thank you. Thank you. Why was it initially thought that white dwarfs could be the dominant thing? Well, because, um, you know, to form a close binary, you need to pass through the common envelope. It is much easier to pass through the common envelope than if you have a giant and survive with the white dwarf here. Any more questions? Europe. Can you have a direct idle capture of the white dwarf by the black hole? No, I didn't consider that. And I don't believe that. Why not? Uh, it's too much energy has to be dissipated. And uh, the, the, the formation rate, you know, that for the final clutches to happen, the white words should pass relatively close by, right? So they, they, should class, they, they should pass not within the rush of the black hole, but not too much far. So it's actually like a streak around the black hole where they can pass. The cross section for this formation rate is extremely small. So in order to explain this, you should have like about 10 or 100 times more black holes than it's actually been ever formed. So uh, our third speaker is uh, Mikhail Petrov, who's uh, uh, discussing observational sig signatures of sub number scale magnetic fields and astrophysical objects. All right, well, I'm going to give you some physical insight on uh, radiation physics, which is well known, uh, synchrotron radiation, but actually, I want to make a point that it's not always a synchrotron radiation. So that's not cool. uh, When people say, and in particular, observers say, well, we have uh, relativistic particles and we have magnetic fields, then the radiation that you would expect is just a synchrotron radiation. This statement is actually false. Because you have turbulence, so you have magnetic fields that fluctuate and change from place to place. So in general, you would expect something different. Nevertheless, people use synchrotron radiation. They just make an ensemble average of different field configurations, and that, that's it. And usually it works. And the reason that it works is that you have usually a cascade, uh, the turbulent cascade. So you steer on some larger scale, which may be a galaxy scale, and then you have magnetic field energy going down to the dissipation scale. And at some place, maybe it's hitting the size of the larger orbit of a particle that's emitting radiation. And that's where you would expect changes in the spectrum to occur. But usually it's very far. So if you calculate how much energy is radiated in sort of, so to say, a large scale fields, is, is enormous amount compared to what you would expect from a small scale contribution. So that actually overwhelms the spectrum and you don't see anything interesting. However, sometimes you have a different situation. Assume that you have a magnetic field that is actually fluctuating on a small scale field, so that the larger scale, the size of a particle orbit in the perpendicular plane, in the plane perpendicular to the local magnetic field, is actually somewhere here, and the peak is even at a smaller scale uh, with a larger divided by a Lorentz factor of a particle. Then you may expect something different to happen, and there is a characteristic uh, parameter here, uh, which is the deflection angle divided by the gamma, or 1 over gamma of the particle. So in general, I can't say it's actually, if you say it well enough, but I can, I can tell you. Uh, this 
parameter is 6 times b times lambda. It's very simple. And b is in gauss, lambda is, I think it's in meters. So 6b lambda tells you whether you're in a regime where synchrotron works well and that corresponds to uh, large deltas, much, much larger than unity. Or if you have delta comparable to unity or maybe comparable to gamma, in fact, then you, you may expect some deviations in the spectrum uh, to occur, and there are different regimes. Uh, synchrotron is somewhere here. The large deflection angle is over here when the correlation length of the field is comparable to the larger orbit. And the small scale angle of regime, when the spectrum is way different from synchrotron, and that's the most interesting, of course, and I'll tell you how one can do that, how one can go from synchrotron to large angle to small angle regime. It's actually a, a quite recent work. Where would you see such fields? Here are two suggestions. One is magnetic reconnection study. This is a simulation uh, on the top. The simulation of reconnection in electron positron ferroplasma. plasma. And this is two-dimensional simulation. And what you see is the magnetic field going one way of the uh, upper side and going the other way on the other side. And the uh, magnetic pressure pushes this reconnection layer, uh, some reconnection occurs, uh, plasma get uh, heated and accelerated in the funnels going to the right and to the left. And if you look in, at the configuration of the field in the perpendicular direction, I mean, in other words, going into the board or out of the board, that the lower panel, you see that bright and dim spots here, which is indicative of small scale fields appearing here. And the strength of the field is actually quite large. It's a fraction of the original field. So it is a significant thing. You can't neglect it. And don't forget that this is the region where you have steering particles. So you have a lot of particles with large gamma factor. And you expect some radiation to occur here, actually, maybe even dominantly. And another possibility is collision and shock. The shock here is more or less sitting over here and it's propagating to the left. And at the shock, you have magnetic field generation by so the so-called Weibull instability. And this uh, generation of the field again occurs on the scale much smaller than the larger radius of a particle. So these are just two possibilities, and there are the sources where you would expect such things. While well, reconnection may happen in pulsars or pulsar with nebulae. Uh, maybe in coronas of accretion disk and IGNs, and uh, shocks is definitely a cure in GRBs. Maybe it may be relevant to uh, supernova shocks as well, if particularly those shocks are mild or optimistic at least. Well, there are, there are other possibilities, of course. So, first of all, let's start with just the synchrotron. Synchrotron is simple. You know that you have the homogeneous magnetic field, particles going around, and when uh, the particle is going toward the observer, which is located somewhere here. This part of the trajectory is well seen because everything is beamed in this direction. And what you see then is the spectrum like this, with the peak <coughs> dictated by the size of this region. Then particle goes away, so the beam points somewhere else, and then it comes back, and that interference, construct, constructive interference of the chromatics over this path produces uh, the spectrum, I mean the peak of the spectrum, and some distribution of the harmonics at lower energies. Okay, in the small scale fields, you can deal with something different. The particle path is actually just fluctuating about its mean direction. It can actually diffuse away uh, in a while because it's a random process. But for 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 some time, you would expect that it may be. Uh, represented as different larger orbits, parts of the larger orbits, and these parts are always pointing to the observer <laughs> located on the right. So you keep seeing this whole trajectory for a while. Of course, that is true only if the, the angle is smaller than 1 over gamma. You can also expect that the angle is large, so you actually go quite large distance than uh, deflect and go quite much distance along that. So you see part of the trajectory, then you don't see part of the trajectory. Well, all kinds of possibilities like that. 
So the, the point that I want to make is that over here, radiation emitted from small scale magnetic fields is always non synchrotron regardless of what you see. You may see sometimes that the spectrum is looking really like synchrotron. Yes, but if you look carefully, you will always see some differences compared to the synchrotron. Mm -hmm. So the point is, whenever you deal with small scale fields, you have to deal with uh, the jitter regime rather than the synchrotron regime and be more careful than usual uh, in uh, treatment of the spectrum. So some physics, actually some arithmetic, uh, how would you uh, find the peak frequency? The peak frequency is dictated by the constructive interference of wave fronts produced over here along this uh, radiation production line. This is just the larger orbit times this angle, which is 1 over gamma, so it's sitting over here. Uh, the frequency is dictated by the radiative uh, coherence time. So you start emitting wave fronts here, you end up emitting them over here. This time is going to be this distance divided by uh, C and uh, gamma squared. Why gamma squared? Because particle is relativistic. So particle goes, goes almost at the speed of light, radiation goes at the speed of light, so you deal with the factors D minus C, and that gives you gamma squared. So altogether, you can just go through this arithmetic and find uh, that uh, the time difference between T mid, uh, beginning and Tm is just the one over the frequency of oscillation of rotation. Uh, and there is a factor of gamma cubed there. And gamma cubed comes from this gamma square that I talked about, and this one over gamma uh, with relation to the Lorentz. Uh, uh, with, with the uh, uh, size of the orbit. So altogether, it boils down to the characteristic frequency, which is 1 over this time, uh, which gives you uh, the non-relativistic uh, frequency of rotation along the slurm orbit times gamma squared. That's the standard thing. The harmonics at lower frequencies are produced over large angles, of course. So you start time is over here, you add time is over here, and of course it's only part of this trajectory that's going exactly to the observer, but there is some constructive interference of all the wave fronts created over this, this length. Calculation is again trivial. Instead of one over gamma, you have to put theta here. So theta there, theta over there. The point the important point to make is that particle is now relativistic not only in the longitudinal direction, but it's also mildly relativistic in the perpendicular direction because this angle is large. So the mean gamma in this direction is smaller than gamma. And there is some uh, gamma perpendicular that you have to take into account, and that's given over here. But otherwise, it's very simple. And just doing the same arithmetic gives you uh, the, the frequency of this harmonic created over the length to be uh, gamma theta to the minus 3 times the synchrotron. So this frequency is uh, a factor of gamma times theta cubed smaller than this peak frequency. That's a well known result. But now, we go to a large angle deflection regime, and instead of that part of the trajectory, I mean, instead of the trajectory that I've been showing, this, this time, uh, we deal with uh, the finite deflection angle. There are no deflection angles larger than that, so that's the largest you can have. So that's where you expect the spectrum to break this harmonic that's created over theta d is the last harmonic that's created in the spectrum. Otherwise, the calculation is just the same, you can see it. The only difference between this slide and the previous slide is that I put subscript D at theta. But, remember now, there is this jitter parameter, deflection over beaming. And this deflection over beaming is exactly gamma-theta combination. 
Exactly. So there is this gamma theta, which now con is converted into delta jitter to the minus 3. And that's how the spectrum looks like. At large frequencies, large energies, in synchrotron. It's exponentially decaying in synchrotron. At low frequencies, it goes as new to the one third, exactly as synchrotron as well. But at this frequency, delta g to the minus 3 uh, times synchrotron, you have the break. All right. In fact, this thing is a little oversimplification because what is actually happening here is, is a little trickier. There are several possibilities, and this is the small angle jitter regime, which we worked out quite a bit for a number of years. And the idea here is that instead of cr creating a constructive interference of the harmonics over uh, the deflection angle of gamma, we now const have constructive interference over a specific correlation length of the field, lambda. And then all the analysis goes the same way. In other words, the wave fronts created along this, uh, along this path uh, for a distance of lambda are inter uh, interfering concurrently. So they produce a significant amount of radiation observed. As we go beyond, the, the phase difference between the wave fronts becomes a killer and they interact either destructively or just don't produce a harmonic at all. So that's going to be a characteristic frequency. And the characteristic frequency now becomes C over lambda times gamma squared. So the overall, well, I, I'm going to skip this uh, interesting stuff. And I just want to show you how this theory now works uh, in simulations. We've done some simulations of the magnetic field generation in the first simple setup, just counterstring particles producing magnetic field and the radiate radiation, produce radiation at the same time. So it's all computed from peak simulations. No assumptions ever made. And the peak spectra are shown here in blue, here and there. You separate the two regimes, the linear growth of the field, I mean, field is actually growing exponentially, but we call it linear growth because it's a linear instability. And saturation and decay. So during the linear growth, the synchrotron theory fails miserably. Just miserably. It, it's off by the position, by the amplitude, by the overall shape. Whereas this jitter theory works remarkably well and even reproduces the part of the synchrotron Spectrum. On the other hand, when the magnetic field becomes large, this factor, uh, this gamma, I'm sorry, this uh, delta jitter 6b lambda becomes much greater than unity. You're in this regime, and synchrotron is a better approximation, and of course, jitter, which is in red here, fails. So, there's the main result. And I just want to point out that whenever you deal with interpretation of observational data, you have to be so careful about the physical conditions you deal with. Usually synchrotron works. But if you see some breaks, it's not necessarily a break in the distribution of elections that what people assume. It may be a physically interesting break that tells you about the Small scale properties of the field that you're actually looking at. That's it. Questions? Well, when you calculate the uh, well, when you calculate the jitter radiation from the uh, from the fixed simulation, what do you do? You take uh, individual particles and then just calculate the radiation from them. Exactly. So take individual particles. Of course, not all of the particles, because right. you can't treat 10 million particles. But you take something like 100 million particles, and uh, you calculate uh, retarded potentials from each of the particles, propagate them through the box 
to the observer with the correct phases. And then uh, take E squared and we calculate the free end. Question. Um, if you consider the uh, particle is energetic enough to emit observable synchrotron radiation, and you consider it oscillating around the null line in the magnetic field, won't spend most of its time in regions where the magnetic field is, is substantial enough that the synchrotron approximation would be a reasonable first approximation? That's certainly true. It depends on how the magnetic field is distributed in space. So if, if you have regions where, uh, which are large enough to trap a particle for quite a while, so it circulates so goes around there for, for a while, of course you have to wait for the resonance time. That's right. But in general, if you have very small scale fields, that's not the case because it cannot trap a particle in the region uh, of size smaller than the line or orbit of the particle. One more question. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Sharon Morrison, and uh, the title of the talk is "You Can Start Equation of State Constraints from Recreating Millisecond X-ray Pulses." Thank you. Okay, so this is research that I've been doing in collaboration with mainly with Dennis Leahy over there, um, uh, but also other collaborators, including Corey, PhD student who's working with me uh, since graduated, and. Okay, so there's lots of very interesting things about neutron stars. Um, it's impossible to focus on all of them in one talk. I'm going to focus on the interesting things that we don't know are happening in the center of the star. In particular, we don't know what the equation of state at the core of a neutron star is, where the density could easily be 10 times denser than uh, the density of, of nuclear matter. Uh, and so, since we don't know anything about it, nuclear physicists can come up with all sorts of crazy guesses about what's happening in the center. And this is a cartoon showing some various uh, possible guesses. But this cartoon doesn't show that each one of those guesses gives a neutron star that has a different radius and mass. And so the idea is that because uh, different guesses tell us different things about the masses and radius of neutron stars, that you can actually go out and measure some masses and sizes of neutron stars that could possibly tell you what's happening in the core of the neutron stars. and actually put some constraints on the equations of state of dense matter. OK, so why would I want to look at very rapidly rotating neutron stars? So I'm interested in neutron stars that are accreting matter, and they have uh, rotation rates that um, are, uh, say, 300, 400 hertz or so, which means that they have um, surface velocities that might be about the tenth of the speed of light, even maybe as large as 20% of the speed of light. And so the interesting thing is what we want to do is we want to look at light that's coming from the surface of the star for the accreting x-ray, millisecond x-ray pulsars. The idea is that you've got a very hot surface where the uh, material is accreting, and so that gives you x-rays that are coming from the surface. Um, and so there's two important things. is that there's effects that are going to be depending on the light deflection, because the neutron star has a strong gravitational field. And light deflection depends on the ratio of the mass to the radius of the neutron star. And then there's rotational Doppler effects, which are going to affect the spectrum and the light curves that we're looking at. And the rotational effects depend on the velocity. And so in other words, the radius of the neutron star, we all know the angular velocity that we see there. And so if you could actually disentangle these things, that actually gives us sort of two different types of measurements of mass and radius. OK, so that's the idea. Of course, it's much harder than that. Um, so first of all, there's the cartoon of the typical uh, a greeting millisecond x-ray pulsar, SAC-J1808, first one that was discovered. Um, these things go into outbursts once every couple of years or so, and they, these outbursts last for a couple months. And it's during those outbursts that you see the millisecond pulsations. OK, here's a cartoon of what we think is happening in one of these systems. You've got your neutron star here, and you've got um, an accretion disk out here, and material is being funneled down through the magnetic field lines and slamming into the neutron star and give you a hot spot. Here's a close-up of, of the hot spot. You basically got something that's like black body emission coming from the surface, but you've got your cloud of electrons which are going to compromise the, uh, the uh, radiation. And of course, the, it's understood that gives you something that's like a power law and gives you um, anisotropic emission so that the light's more um, uh, strongly emitted along the uh, surface of the star. Beam. 
So it gives you a combination spectrum. And this has been, um, people have done MHC simulations, like the group at Cornell, um, and they basically show this picture more or less works. They get more complicated hotspots than what we'll be dealing with, but we'll talk about that. Um, so the idea here is that we're going to be doing ray tracing, where we're going to assume a hotspot model, and you basically have something that's rotating, and you can put in all the relativistic effects actually fairly easily. You basically want to put in your light bending and all of the um, Doppler aberration effects you need to go in there. And that basically is going to allow you to give a periodic light curve. And there's going to be some shape associated with that. And um, that just shows you the difference between what you have with Newtonian and general relativity. Um, this diagram here does not show the one extra effect that we put in, which is important for rotation, which is the star's oblate shape, which is surprisingly important in some cases. Um, I won't go into that anymore, though. All right, so this is um, the first star that I'm going to talk about, um, called 1814. Spins at 314 hertz, and um, it's got a spectrum that was observed from Chandra. And um, there's a lot of details of what goes into our model. We have to guess at the microphysics of what's going on. Um, some things like the guesses that we have a hot circular spot in this certain size don't actually matter very much. We've tried playing with the sizes and the shapes, and it doesn't really affect things very much. Composite black body, composite spectrum. Um, there's some anisotropy, so Coke's alpha is the angle between the normal to the surface and the direction the photons emitted, and so there's a dependence on what angle <coughs> it's giving off. And so we have a free parameter, A, which tells us how anisotropic emission is. Okay, so the idea is that this has been observed over a number of days during the outburst, and what you expect is that the mass and the radius and the inclination angle of the system <coughs> can't change from day to day, but it's possible that the location of the spot may be changing and some spectral parameters are changing. And so we're doing a fit over all possible parameters that can be done. This is an example of one of the fits, two different energy bands, and um, uh, oh, uh, well, so there's evidence that there's a second spot that um, has to be dealt with, and so uh, that's in the models. I can tell you about that else some other time. And what we do then is we do a case by case, all possible masses and radii and all possible parameters, and you look for the lowest values of chi squared, and then you make a mass radius plot. So this is all the possible masses that the neutron star could have and all the possible equatorial radius. And the um, two sigma allowed region is this red region, and then the three sigma region is this yellow region. And since this is a pretty model dependent kind of picture we're doing, we figure three sigma is a pretty uh, conservative way to talk about things. The black curves are the different guesses or equations of state curves for that the neutron stars might have. And what this picture just shows is that we have for this particular system, it's preferring to have a very large radius star and very high mass. And it seems to be agreeing with this equation state over here, which is pure neutrons, which is obviously wrong. But there are, uh, well, pure neutrons is not right. <laughs> but there could be other equations of state, say, going through here, which would agree with it. These are a lot of different equations of state. I can tell you about which ones they are later on. OK, so that's star one. Star two, that's J1808. Um, these are three different outbursts that it goes through. This is a plot of flux versus many bays and the light goes up and goes down. And what Jake Hartman did was he took various periods of time and in the data folded it over carefully and got different pulse shapes. And so we made use of these pulse shapes. And we did a similar sort of thing. We took data from two of the better periods, this box over here and this box, and asked for a model for the star where the mass radius and inclination are the same, but we allow the locations of the spot and parameters to change between those two periods, similar to what we did the other. Um, this is the one period in 1998, um, kind of nice looking data, 2002. Um, the data doesn't look quite as nice. The star wasn't as bright, so it's much noisier data. Um, we've had to add some amount of reflection from uh, something like a disk or a uh, creation column, we don't know what's causing it, but that's part of the model as well. Now this is the plot then of, for this star, the allowed values of masses and radii, which are um, allowed by the data. And it's again two with three sigma allowed regions. And what this star requires is lower masses and smaller sizes. 
And what's more interesting is that instead of just looking at this, let's look at the data for the two stars. Okay. And so the first star that I showed you seems to prefer parameters in this region. So it wants to have a star that is on the high mass side, so maybe above two solar masses. And this, this uh, green, the, the green star, <laughs> wants to have lower mass stars. And so the thing, though, is that this does not say that these are inconsistent results. All you require is an equation of state curve to somehow sample both of those regions in order for this to be consistent with the data. And so I'll just show you an example of uh, my, uh, my new guesstimate equation of state. It's something, uh, it's not based on any physics, it's just a curve that will go through the data. And this is an example of mine. And so we have the equation of state, which is just a little bit stiffer than the APR equation of state over here. It could go through the, um, the allowed region for the uh, 1814 star, and it could then also sample this region over here. And so this is something that would be allowed from the type of modeling that we're doing. And I was actually quite surprised to see, actually, a recent paper um, by these folks over here that were looking at, they were looking at um, analysis of photospheric radiation um, expansion uh, bursts and doing complicated modeling of theirs. And they actually came to a similar kind of results that an equation of state in the region that I was just showing over here, where you have neutron stars with radii of about 12 kilometers, but a wide range of possible masses, and in particular, a fairly high maximum mass, is actually something that would be allowed uh, by their model. So I was kind of, that doesn't mean that either of us are right, but it's kind of interesting that we both came up with sort of consistent results. Okay, uh, so my conclusion that I want to just say, first of all, is just that the neutron star equation of state is still, I think, very difficult to constrain, and no one should tell you that uh, they definitely know what it is. Um, we've been focusing our work on looking at the accreting millisecond period X-ray pulsars, just because we, we like the fast spin and the fact that it gives you a little bit uh, of the Doppler effects in there. Um, there's def this is definitely a model-dependent type of uh, constraint, and we're assuming that the light is coming from hot spots, for instance. Um, but however, we do seem to find that there is some kind of uh, consistent uh, region that could be allowed uh, in the equation of state space. And I'll just comment that there's one other star that we're starting to look at right now, which hopefully will also be consistent. <laughs> I'll stop there.